All right, welcome back. This is Patent 3, Part 1, and we're in the textbook at pages 770 to 772 and 782 to 798. Um, and essentially what we're going to look at um, in this capsule is the application process to get a patent. And then we're going to look at what the rights that the Patents Act confers upon um, the patent holders are. And specifically, we'll look at how do we determine whether someone has infringed upon those rights in the specific context of what it means to use the inventions. As we'll see, there's a protection under patent law that's somewhat broader than what we saw under copyright, right? That covers not just copying what someone did, but also making it, using it, um, essentially to prevent people from either coming up with the same invention or reproducing the same invention when it's been disclosed with a new method um, or to, to, for someone to make a use that is not necessarily contemplated by the invention but that still depends on that person having access to the invention that's protected under patent law. In general, going to happen um, in the context of people not paying for it because we'll see there's a doctrine called exhaustion that says when you've paid for a right under the patent regime so when you've bought the invention right typically um, you know it's commercialized and then you just buy it once you've bought the invention we'll see that generally you're protected for all uses so we don't let the patent holder come into your home and try to limit what you do or don't do with the invention as long as it's you know the use that would reasonably be contemplated under the regime a use that is personal and that is the purpose of the invention of course if you start making copies of it and selling them then you're you know making a use that was not directly contemplated when you bought it and therefore you'll be infringing upon the exclusive rights of the patent holder to make and then subsequently sell the thing right or copies of it so, in terms of the application process, right, as we said, patent law is a regime where registration is mandatory, right? So, first, it's not optional for you to have um, a patent to get it registered. And that's unlike other regimes, as we said in earlier weeks. It's unlike, you know, copyright law where you have a, a copyright by virtue of the criteria that are set out in the in the act right and you don't have to register it you can register it and as we saw there's a number of reasons why you might want to do that generally having to do with making it easier for you to prove that you have a copyright which is necessary if you want to sue someone for having infringed upon that same copyright but registration is not mandatory and so your copyright even if you register it doesn't arise from the moment you register it instead it arises earlier generally from the moment that you've met the statutory conditions because it exists naturally by virtue of the act not of registration when you've met the various conditions under patent law right it's different you get a similar monopoly as you do under copyright as we saw in all areas of intellectual property law generally what you get is a monopoly for a limited period of time. So you're the only person that can make the thing or sell the thing, right, for a limited period of time. You get a similar monopoly under patent law as you do under these various other areas of intellectual property law. As we'll see, under patent law, it's for 20 years. However, for you to get that monopoly, unlike under copyright, for instance, you have to register your patent. You don't have it, even if you meet the conditions, right, as long as you haven't gone to the government, paid the fee, and registered it. So what's necessary for you to get registration? So the requirements are under Section 27 of the Act, and essentially what that's going to say is that you have to go to the government, pay the fee, and meet the various conditions as to what you have to have in your application. And, and essentially, right, we'll, we'll break it down this way, right? The specific requirements are found, as I just said, at section 27. They're detailed in the book at pages 770 and 771. But we'll simplify it as, right, first, who, right? So it has to be clear 
who owns the patent. Generally, it's the person who's made the invention. And in that case, it has to be clear in the, um, in the application that that person wants to get the benefit of the patent rights. But it's not always going to be the person who invented it by virtue of assignment or by virtue of employment, as we'll see later, right? It might be someone else in the inventor who has the right not just to get the patent, right? Not just to exercise the rights under the patent when they have it, right? But it can also be another person who has the right to file the patent in the first place because even though the invention was invented by, say, an employee, by virtue of the law, it is the employer who is deemed to own both the rights and the right to register the patent beforehand. Similarly, you might have an assignment. So someone can assign their rights, as we said, that's true under various areas of intellectual property law, to someone else. And that assignment can happen even before you register. And so it's not just a matter of you getting a patent and then transferring it to someone else, that's assignment, right? We said various permutations of that, to be in whole, in part, for money, for free, forever. But essentially, you can transfer your right or a portion thereof to someone else. When you do a sign, right, that can happen after you get the patent, of course, because it's your right, but it can also happen before. And so you can assign your right to file the patent. You can make a preemptive assignment to someone. You can say, I'm selling you, not my patent, because I don't have it yet, but my right to apply for a patent, and that's allowed, and in that case, the person making the application is not going to be the person who invented the invention. Then it has to be clear what it is, right? What it is that you've invented. So there has to be a description of your invention, right? And what it is. Then it has to be clear how to make it. Because as we said, right, it's not just a matter of you saying I've invented a snowmobile. The bargain of the patent, as we said, right, what you do in exchange for the commercial monopoly that the government grants you is disclosure. And disclosure isn't limited to saying I've invented this, right? It's also, it also includes how you make it. So it has to be, as we said, the standard being the posita, it has to be disclosed, right? The way to make it to an extent, not just that the person reasonably skilled in the art would understand what it is that you've made, but would also understand how to make it. And as we said, in, in um, I think last week's capsules, disclosure is part of that bargain. And so if you don't sufficiently disclose either of these things, you're going to be stuck and your patent is gonna be invalidated because the whole thing rests on you getting something in exchange for you doing things right under the act and meeting your obligations. So who owns the patent, right? Or who is the prospective owner of the patent? then it has to be clear what the invention is, then it has to be clear how to make it, and finally, we'll add what it does. That's what we call the claim. It's what we use as, as claim construction, right? So it has to be clear what it is you're claiming your invention does. And as we said, that's going to limit the size of your lawn, essentially. It's going to limit what it is that you can prevent other people from doing. So the right, the exclusive right for 20 years that you'll get under the patent regime is not just to make your thing, it's to make your thing for the purpose that you said it is to be made for. And therefore someone could, now there's much more nuance to this, but someone could essentially make the thing for another purpose and you wouldn't be protected under that. And as we said, if it's too broad, for a lot of reasons you risk invalidating your patent. And so you have to be careful there and when you have made your claim and we analyze what it is you're protected for, we apply claim construction principles, which look at what it is, that, what, what section of use you've limited and therefore what section of use you can prevent anyone else from doing in your stead. So these are basically the four things, right, that are to be disclosed under section 27 of the act, 27.3 specifications, essentially the description of the thing and how to make it. Section 27.4 has the claim as you saying my invention does this and that's why it's great and therefore what you're eventually going to be protected for. Then there is an additional requirement, right? So this point right here actually there's a bit of a problem, right? This is not about 
use, this is about registration. Um, so registration, you have to have these things, right? We'll say there's a further requirement that it has to be true, and that's under section 53. And that gets us back to essentially this bargain that we discussed, right? So not only do you have to disclose your thing properly, you have to disclose your thing in a way that is, you know, faithful, true, and complete. And what does section 53 say? Section 53 essentially says that your patent is void if what you said is not true, right? It's, it's more complicated than that the way it's written, but the essence of it is that. The essence of it is if one of these things is not true, your patent is void. And that's important, right? The remedy that is clearly stated under Section 53 of the Act is that your patent is void, the whole thing, right? So it's not a matter of, um, it's not a matter of, you know, reading down, right, or limiting your monopoly. Say if you've made a claim, if you've made three claims, if you said my invention does A, B, and C, and then C turns out to be false. It's not just a matter of saying, we'll cancel C, and therefore the only thing you'll be able to prevent other people from doing is A and B, right? Which, which would essentially solve the problem that arises in the first place. But that's not what Section 53 says. What Section 53 says is the whole thing is void. And so if you've lied on C, right, the whole patent is void. A, B, and C, and the whole protection, and then your thing is public and disclosed, so you're screwed and you don't get anything for 20 years, and on top of that, someone else can make it because now it is public, right, by virtue of you having had a patent on it in that public registry. And that is generally if it's intentional, right? The standard is far more complicated than that, but for our purposes, we can just say if you intentionally lie, right, not if you make a mistake, as we'll see, there's another process for if you make a mistake that's called a disclaimer. And in some circumstances, you'll be able to say, I got C wrong, right, preemptively, you actively saying that before someone else does. And then the patent registry, in some circumstances, is going to be able to say, well, just cancel C, not the whole, the whole thing. If the lie is intentional, however, under the rules for registration, the whole thing is void um, to that extent. Then you have section 102, right, which is not um, particularly important, um, but in section, uh, in that section, in section 10.2, right, you're told that essentially you can keep it confidential for 18 months. And so, of course, the problem that arises is that you, um, that your patent is disclosed to the public, right, when you file the application, generally it's public but then you don't know if you're going to get your monopoly. That doesn't mean that for the time that the government's looking at your application, someone can copy your thing. That's forbidden, right? It's important. Even if you don't have your monopoly yet, that's forbidden for someone to copy it in the, inter in the interim period. The problem that arises, of course, is if you do not get your patent afterwards, right, then you're stuck because not only do you don't ha not have your monopoly, it's also public and people can copy it, right? What you might have done if you knew you wouldn't get your patent is either write your application differently or not told anyone, right? Taking advantage of confidentiality, which is a converse of the regime and is another way to protect your invention, right? One way to protect other people from making money with your thing is to get a monopoly. Another one is to just keep it secret and therefore no one knows about it, no one can make it. If you don't get your patent, you don't get to do that, right? Because if you don't get your patent, it's public, and then you're kind of, right, doubly screwed. And therefore, the section provides that for some circumstances, it can be confidential while it's under examination, right? So while you don't know yet whether you'll get your patent, right? It can be confidential for that period. And therefore, essentially, for, all, for, for our purposes, if you do not get your patent in the end, you'll still be able to protect it with other means such as confidentiality or trade secrets. Then by virtue of sections 34 and 35 of the Act, right, you're told that you will not always have a patent examiner examining the patent application. 
And that's important, right, because this is pretty complex stuff. In most circumstances for the big patents that we see, um, you know, in the cases that we read, generally pharmaceutical patents, right, the stakes are tremendously high, right? It's tens of billions of dollars sometimes. And therefore, generally, there will be inspection because the government's going to be reluctant to give you a monopoly on something that might have, you know, billions of dollars of implications for competition and other people and, and as a result for prices for customers. And therefore, they're going to want to inspect it. But Section 34 says that it's, uh, or Section 35, sorry, says that it's not systematically the case. And so if you have some person inventing something that's of limited importance, maybe the patent registry is going to choose not to conduct an examination. In other words, not to look at the substance of it, right? They'll look at whether you put the four things in there. That's a form requirement. But they won't look at the substance of your application. In other words, they won't look at whether what you said makes sense, is consistent, is internally consistent, right, and appears to be true. So that does not systematically happen by virtue of Section 35. By virtue of Section 34, right, what you're told is that eventually it becomes public, of course, and it becomes public before you get your patent, essentially. And so you get, right, a period of public inspection before you get your patent. And one way to understand this, of course, is to say that essentially the public is going to be the ones doing what the government did not do, right? Because one way to protect people from wrongfully getting a patent, so for getting a patent on something that they shouldn't, it's not patentable subject matter, or preventing people from getting a patent that either lies or does not do the things that you have to do properly, right? One of the protections against that is the government looking at it before giving it to you and then not giving it to you if it turns out that you don't meet the conditions. But of course, one other way is for the public to do the exact same thing. And that's what Section 34 says. Section 34 says before you get your patent, right, the government's going to give notice on that journal we talked about that essentially no one reads. And the journal's going to say, right, Mr. X is trying to get a patent on a snowmobile and people are going to be able to oppose it, right? Not because they don't like the person, but because the person, they don't think, meets the various conditions. And that does the same thing as what the government would have done, right? Someone can come in and prevent you from wrongfully getting your patent by saying that what you claimed is not true or that you don't meet the various conditions. The other thing that we have to understand about this, of course, is that the public is a word that is somewhat misleading because, of course, the public generally has better things to do than read patent applications, try to decipher the science, and try to see if it meets the conditions, especially when they don't get paid for that, right? So the public really means anybody, and anybody generally includes your competitors. And your competitors, if they're in the same industry as you are, have a very strong interest in making sure that you don't get a patent that you shouldn't get. And so you can be sure that they'll have the necessary economic incentive to hire you know, various experts who are, again, also part of the public to look at this thing and see whether or not it makes sense. And so for all intents and purposes, sometimes Section 34 might be stronger than Section 35 because you'll have the experts hired by all of your competitors looking at your application to see if you meet the conditions as opposed to having just the government doing it. And therefore, that might be a stronger protection against you getting a patent that you shouldn't get. Then section 38 says, right, if you don't meet the conditions, the government sends you a letter and says what it is that you got wrong. Under section 73, right, this is important, there is what we call a deemed abandonment. And so you are deemed to have abandoned your application when you don't respond to the government. And so assuming that you file your patent application, right, and the government looks at it under Section 35, and then the government says, hey, I need more information, send me those documents. Well, if you don't respond within six months, right, you've, you're deemed to have abandoned your application. As a result, the government can just throw it away. There is a further mechanism for reinstating it, right, but you have to prove various things generally that you acted in good faith. And so that's a pretty strong remedy, right? 
you, you can get it um, you know, overturned by showing that you've acted in good faith, but by default, if you don't respond within six months, the whole thing is done, and generally it, it's also done forever. All right, so um, perhaps we will erase part of this um, because it's getting a bit crowded. Um, and now we'll look at the second um, issue that I've, that I've mentioned here, which is the issue of use. So we'll leave the, the, the things that you have to put in your patent application, right? But we'll remove the other things that we have to remember under this section. All right, so these, as I said, are the, the things that you have to disclose when you seek registration under the registration process, right? So now, what is it under the Patent Act that you get the exclusive right to do? Of course, as in all areas of intellectual property law, what you get is essentially a commercial monopoly. So you get an exclusive right to do various things with the stuff that you now own. And um, as we said earlier, that's generally broader than what you find in other areas of, of intellectual property law, like copyright. You don't just get a right for people not to copy your things, an exclusive right to, you know, in the case of copyright, make copies, make use, perform in public, right? For an invention, you get an exclusive right upon the thing, how it's made, and people using it for the purpose you've mentioned, so the claim. And so if they make something substantially similar for the same purpose, they might be, you know, they might be prevented from doing that under your patent protection. Similarly, if they find another way to make your thing mischievously, they might be prevented from doing that under the patent act, the patents act, right? Then the term um, under section um, 45, as we said, is 20 years. And that's 20 years from the time that you file your application, as we said last week. And so quite importantly, right, um, by default, the period starts running from the time you filed your application. So if it takes one year for the government to give you your patent, from the time you get it, you only are protected for 19 years, not 20. There's a further mechanism that's mentioned um, at page 782, whereby the government can turn the clock back, right, without really asking anyone for much permission. But by default, the period starts running from the time you filed your application. Then we have a case to illustrate these various issues, right, which is the Monsanto case. And again, that's a, that's a pretty old case, right? So the other case that we read from the Supreme Court is the Harvard Mouse case. That was earlier than the Monsanto case, but not much. And it's also at the Supreme Court. So the Harvard Mouse case, which we looked at um, in, in very much detail, basically says that you cannot patent a higher life form. So Harvard College, as we said, found this way to make a mouse that gets cancer more easily. And that's good because it is similar to the way human beings get cancer and therefore the mouse has the potential, right, to, to make it easier for researchers to find cures for cancer in humans. And therefore, Harvard College tries to go and patent this great invention that they've just come up with. Right? And they try to patent both, and that's not particularly important, right, both the way to make the mouse and the mouse itself. And the Supreme Court says that doesn't work because it's a higher life form. And the Supreme Court in the Harvard mouse case introduces this distinction of a higher and a lower life form, and it says basically that you're not protected for a higher life form. Basically, right, the, the distinction's not clear cut, but a seed or yeast would not be a higher life form, a mouse or a human being would be. The difference ostensibly is what they call a sentient being, something that has 
some sort of a conscience. It's similar to a human being, right? Something not necessarily that understands everything, but that's afraid of, you know, dying or that when you hurt it, you know, hurts, and therefore we think ethically that it's bad, right? The Supreme Court didn't say explicitly that it was introducing an ethical requirement, but for all intents and purposes, essentially the reason they introduced that requirement has a very strong ethical underpinning. And so subsequently in the Monsanto case, right, the Supreme Court has to apply what it said in Harvard Mouth. And basically the conclusion is, right, that it doesn't apply because it's a seed, and it's pretty clear that a seed is not a higher life form. There are some specific, right, um, distinctions, though. One of those is that the thing that Monsanto tried to protect is not the seed itself. It's essentially what we're talking about here as a GMO. Monsanto comes up with a better seed because it resists the most commonly used herbicides. And therefore, people buy it because, you know, they want to grow their crops without, um, you know, resisting, without having their crop vulnerable to the herbicides. And so, since it's a seed, right, the end result is a seed, you don't trigger this protection under the Harvard mouse case of a higher life form because a seed is clearly a lower life form. It doesn't have a conscience, is not a sentient being. And so we're clear from that specific exception, which applies as a van from the Harvard mouse case. The other thing is that Monsanto is trying to protect the gene. And we won't get into whether it could have protected the seed or not, right? But what it protected here is the gene. And so the modified genetic sequence, right, the GMO, is what they're protecting. And as we'll see, that gives them protection on the resulting seed. And for all intents and purposes, it also prevents anyone from using the gene. And so for, for them, right, protecting the gene is simpler because it's clear that it doesn't fall under the exception to protection under the Patent Act. And second, right, it doesn't really matter for them because they get the same protection over the resulting seed because the gene is in the seed, right? And so it's protected for the use that Monsanto intended it for, of course, right? That's the claim, and you're only protected to the, protected to the extent of the claim. And it also prevents anyone from coming up with the seed because the only way you get the seed is by using that genetic sequence. And so for Monsanto, it's really the same as having protection over the resulting seed. So what happens in the Monsanto case, right? So we have this guy who makes a use that is essentially commercial, right? And so the Supreme Court says that the purpose of patent protection is to protect business interests. And that's important, right? We said a lot of times that various areas of intellectual property are about money, right? What you get from your exclusive right to do something under your monopoly is money, right? People can do it, right, if, if they're not you. And as a result, the way they get permission to do it is by paying you money. Similarly, oftentimes, even though that's never a specific stated criterion, the way we assess whether someone's infringed upon your intellectual property rights is by looking if they have made money, right? And so generally, if someone uses your book under copyright for the purpose of their research or their personal use, right, they make a copy of something they've bought for their own use, well then, they don't sell it, they don't make money, and that's a pretty strong indication that that's not infringement because the things that both infringement and the underlying right protect is your exclusive right to have your commercial monopoly, to make money, to have the monopoly over the sale, right, or the profiting off what you've invented. That's also true under patent law. And the Supreme Court emphasizes this by saying that the purpose of the patent regime is to protect business interests, right? And so, it wouldn't necessarily have been the same thing if someone inadvertently used the seed that Monsanto is protected for. So one of the things that we'll see the contract says in Monsanto is that not only are you, you know, paying for the right to use your seed, right? And so you pay, you buy the seed, and then you plant it, you know, in your, uh, to get your crop, right? 
The only thing you're paying for in that case, and that's because it's specified in the contract, right, might or might not be true or not for the contract, we won't get into that, right? The exclusive right you get is to use it once. So a distinctive characteristic of crops is that you can use them multiple times, right? You can grow your crop and then get the seed, right, and from it and then use it next year. And the contract says it's not something you're allowed to do. And so obviously if someone, right, finds the seed without paying for it, then they're making a use that is forbidden because they haven't paid for it. But not only that, right, if someone buys a seed once and then uses it a second time, that's also forbidden because a contract said so, because what you've paid for is not a right to use it as many times as you like, it's a right to use it once. Now, reason for that, right, the court says the underlying reason for the protection is the protection of business interests. And so the court says, right, this is not a case where something else might have happened that would not necessarily have been protected. So say, right, the wind blows and then someone gets the, the protected seed under land. They have not paid for it, right? They call that a blow by. They haven't paid for it and don't know about it. Well, right, and, and quite importantly, right, as, as, as we saw um, at paragraph um, 13, right, you don't really have a way um, to know <laughs> that you're using the seed, right? It's not a different color. It's not a different look. It, it looks the exact same unless you have a lab to test it. And so it's quite likely that someone will just get it on their land, right, because of, a, of the wind blowing and then assume that it's the crop that they've put there in the first place because it looks the exact same. But then if they plant it, of course, they've made a use that they haven't paid for because they have not paid for the right to use Monsanto's protected seed, but they don't know about it. And the Supreme Court says, it's very careful to say, we're not looking at this in this case. And so if it's an accident, right, and it's a single farmer, you know, it's not their fault, they don't know about it, don't have a way to know about it, the, prote the, the, the protection of the patent holder might not and likely would not apply. The Supreme Court's careful to say this is not what's happening here. What's happening here is a guide that has tons of it, right? And I think if my, if my memory serves me well, he also goes out and sell it, and again, Selling it is something that's a pretty strong indication that you're trying to do what the patent holder has the exclusive right to do, which is to sell the thing and make money. And the guy here has so much of it, right, that it's pretty clear that he didn't get it accidentally because the wind doesn't blow and then, you know, essentially gets crop on 13 acres of land, right, which is basically what happens here. And so, the court's careful to frame it, for instance, in paragraph 17, in saying that here the problem is basically that the, the farmer is making a use that is commercial. First of all, he's getting tons of it. So it's clearly not an accident. And on top of it, it clearly jeopardizes the rights of the monopoly holder, of the patent holder. Because, right, one or a couple seeds blowing, you know, with the wind blowing on your land, right, that you wouldn't have paid for otherwise doesn't threaten the monopoly holder because right you wouldn't have paid for it and it's not much of it. In our case, the guy has acres and acres of land full of the seed, so clearly the same concern does not apply. First, it's not an accident, and second, it does threaten the commercial monopoly of the business uh, of, of the monopoly patent holder. Right, because the guy would have had to pay thousands of dollars to get the seed for 13 acres of land. And so that's the extent to which, in that case, right, the Supreme Court says this is a use that's, for, that's forbidden because essentially it's a use that threatens the monopoly of the patent holder. And the court goes on to define from paragraph 28 and following, right, what it is that you have a monopoly over. So as we said, right, the definition is under section 42 of the Patent Act, and it's pretty broad, right? It says basically 
a person that gets the patent over an invention has the exclusive right to do basically all the things that someone would do with the invention, right? Make it, sell it, and use it, essentially. And this, the Supreme Court in that case goes on to define the concept of use, which is a, a limit to what it is that the patent holder can do, right? Can have the exclusive right to do. And so a use, right? If you make a use that you haven't paid for, that you don't have authorization from the patent holder to do, then you're infringing upon their, their patent. You're infringing upon their exclusive right to do specifically that or to get money you know, for giving authorization to do it. And the court goes on to define this um, in a way that's pretty helpful, right? So paragraphs 28 and following. The court says it has to be a purposive and contextual analysis. What does that mean, right? Purposive means, means it has to be an interpretation of the word use that gives effect to the patent, um, of the, to the patent act, right? So the, to the underlying purpose of the patent act, which the court just said earlier is to protect the business interests, to make money, basically, of the patent holder. So purposive construction, a construction that, that goes at go, goes with the underlying policy considerations and purpose of the act and contextual that looks at the circumstances as we said if someone is using it accidentally doesn't know about it it's probably not use because it's not the purpose of the protection and also because when we look at the context it becomes clear that there, there, this should not fall under um, the exception the, under the um, exclusive rights of the patent holder under section um, 42, regardless of how broad it may be. So what does it mean to use, right? So first of all, right, the definition of use is going to be bounded by this definition, which is the root of everything, right? So what is it going to mean? First of all, right, a use can be indirect. And so in that case, right, if, if what's protected is the gene, but what you're using is not directly the gene, but the resulting seed, that's not something prima facie that's excluded. And therefore, it's something that the patent holder can prevent you from doing. And so it can be indirect. Right? Then what's also protected is, you know, the, the, the way to make the thing, right? So what we, we'll call it manufacture, right? So as we said earlier, right, you're saying how you're making your thing and you're protected for that insofar as it helps make the invention. So the, the court says, right, if someone basically makes the thing another way, right, or makes use of your method, either to make something else or an improved version of what or whatever, right? Then that doesn't necessarily mean that the patent holder is not able to claim protection. So if someone makes it some other way, right? You can still claim that they're infringing upon your monopoly. Then what's important here, right, as well is that profit doesn't matter. So what matters is whether you're threatening the rights of the patent holder. So basically, right, what, if you go out and make copies to sell it, even if you don't manage to sell it, you've threatened the right of the patent holder, which is, you know, the exclusive right to sell the thing. And therefore, that's going to fall under the thing that you're, the things that you're prevented from doing. It doesn't matter that you haven't made any money. It doesn't matter that you haven't been able to sell it, right? What matters is basically the, the, the underlying intent or the underlying action, which in itself threatens the monopoly of the patent holder. So you don't have to have made profit, right? So not actual profit. Then the most important part is intent, right? So the court is going to say, right, that there is no need to have intent. And that's important, right? This is, a, 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 this is not 
like the criminal law, where we have this added requirement, not just that someone having done the thing, but have having intended to do the thing, right? So in the criminal law generally will need you know, the, the, the mischievous act and the mischievous intent, right? If you accidentally kill someone, it's not murder. It's the killing of another person, but it's not murder. It's not the thing that you go in prison 20 years for because it's not intentional. It's an accident, assuming you weren't, you know, grossly negligent. So even though the action is covered, right, the intent you don't meet the conditions for, and therefore it's not murder. The Supreme Court's careful to say here, in the case of patent infringement, you don't have a, a separate requirement of intent. You don't have to show that the person, for instance, that got the seed intended to basically, you know, use it in a way that infringes upon the rights of the patent holder. However, the court said, there is a presumption that comes from possession. And so, if you have, in that case, the seed, there is a presumption even if you haven't used it yet to grow crops, which is one of the forbidden things, there's a presumption that the reason you're using it, that you're possessing it, is to eventually use it. So it doesn't matter that you're not currently using it. And in fact, when you're possessing the, 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 the infringing invention, the infringing copy of the invention, there's a presumption that eventually you'll use it, right? and that's going to be infringement. But the presumption is just that, it's a presumption. And so we assume that you're going to use it. That essentially means that the person, the patent holder doesn't have to prove that. So if we assume that you'll eventually use it, the patent holder doesn't have to prove that you have intent to eventually use it. However, as any presumption, it is rebuttable. And so no need to prove it, absent evidence to the contrary. So we'll assume that you intend to use it until right, you come in and prove otherwise. Right? You prove that it was an accident, for instance, that you didn't know that the thing was on your land. So even if you possessed it, you're showing with evidence that you have no intent. In other words, you're rebutting the presumption of intent right, that comes as a result of possession. And so intent, as we said, is not a criterion. Why is it not a criterion? Because it arises out of a presumption from possession. So when you possess it, there's a presumption that you intend to use it. However, even though proof of intent is not required, proof of no intent is going to be helpful because proof of no intent is going to rebut the presumption and therefore basically, you know, put you, um, protect you from the patent holder um, trying to claim that what you've done infringes upon their monopoly. So if you show that you have no intent, that's helpful because it rebuts the presumption of use that comes as a result of possession. And so in that case, right, the farmer essentially illustrates um, what I've just said. So the farmer says a bunch of things, right, that don't really make sense um, based on the context um, of the specific facts of the case, right? So basically, farmer says, I didn't know it was there. Well, it's very unlikely if you have 13 acres of it that you don't know it's there. You should. And it probably didn't come as a result of the wind blowing and as a result, right, it's something that you're forbidden from doing. And the farmer says, I did not intend to use it, for instance. So in that case, right, as we said, use is defined in part by your claim. So not just the fact of the seed. As we said, Monsanto is not just protected for their gene and the resulting seed in that case. What Monsanto is protected for is the use of that gene for a purpose that's narrower, as we said. What you're claiming the invention does bounds the scope of your protection. You're only protected for the invention to the extent that it does what you say it does. And so someone, you know, using it for another purpose ostensibly would not be protected. 
So the guy said, well, even if I did have the seed, right, I did not use it for its intended purpose. And here its intended purpose is to protect against a specific herbicide. And guy says, right, I didn't intend to use a herbicide on it or for it to not, you know, react to the herbicide. And as a result, what I'm doing is something that is not within the scope of protection because I'm using it, but I'm not using it for the forbidden purpose, which is to avoid the specific herbicide. And the court says again, that does not really um, bode well with the presumption that we just said. It doesn't really matter, right, that you, um, that you did not intend to use it, right? Th th there's no need to prove that. The fact that you have possession of it, right, means that there is a presumption that you intend to use it. And on top of that, in that case, the presumption's not rebutted. So the guy didn't show that he didn't have intent in a way that was satisfactory. So if someone said, it's an accident, I clearly did not intend to use it, right? Then the presumption's rebutted. What the guy's doing here is, is saying, I have 13 acres of it. I don't plan on using it with that herbicide. Well, the reason that you'd have 13 acres of it is generally because you intend to use it with that herbicide. And on top of that, the reason people buy that seed in the first place is not because they're sure that it's going to be exposed to the herbicide, right? It might just be because, you know, they want to prevent that risk. And therefore, what the seed does, the protected gene within the seed, what it does, right, is, is protect you from that risk even if it doesn't materialize. And so, basically, right, it's the only case for reading, so it's not clear what all the principles are. But you can see that to rebut the presumption of intent with a proof of no intent, right, you need something very strong, right? You need to show that it was a total accident, that you clearly did not intend to use it. It's not sufficient for you to make an argument that's somewhat convoluted as the guy did to say, right, I don't intend to use a herbicide on it. Because in fact, in most cases, right, what you're protecting against is not the herbicide, but the risk of it coming into contact and ruining your crop for that year. And that's what the court defines, by the way, as, as standby utility. Standby utility, right, is you benefiting from the thing, not just if it actually comes into contact with the herbicide, but the standby value of it being resistant in the event that, so protecting against the risk, as I said, that it does come in contact with the herbicide, right? And that's around paragraphs um, 82 and following of um, the decision. And the court um, is going to reiterate, right, um, at the very end of the decision, basically um, what we discussed regarding policy arguments. So the Supreme Court is going to say, as it did in the Harvard Mouse case, that its role is limited, right? So its role is not to say whether it's good or bad for a seed to be protected, and whether it's good or bad to have a contract that says even if you buy it, right, you can't use it the next year. And not only that, you can't really know which sheet it is. The only way you know is because there's that odd inspector for Monsanto that comes onto your land, takes a sample of it, and then sues you for infringement when you're just a poor, well-meaning farmer. The court says, you know, there might be evidence as to the, the fact that this is not a wise policy decision, right? That this is not illegal, but it's, that it's a bad law. Basically, that it's a bad policy and that we shouldn't have a law that allows that. The court's careful to say, as it did in the Harvard Mouse case, right, especially in the dissent of the Harvard Mouse case that we read last week, that it's not its role. The Patent Act does not create an exception for bad contracts or for bad people or for uses that don't conform with generally accepted standards of morality. And as a result, it's not for the Supreme Court to say we'll create a new exception because there is no underlying you know, legal basis for it. There's no underlying article in the Patent Act that would allow the court to say that. So the court says, you know, it, it, it is open to the government, right, to make a law, to make an exception if they think it's not wise. That might be true, might not be true, but it's not for us to decide. It's for the government to decide, right, 
We don't invent exceptions. We interpret the law. We don't create exceptions that don't exist. Then at uh, page 797, you have a couple specific sections that are somewhat helpful. First, section 49 is interesting, right? Not that important, but interesting. Section 49 says, basically, that you can have an assignment of an invention that you don't have a patent over yet. So if you have an invention that is confidential, no one knows about it because you haven't filed your patent yet, as I said earlier, you're allowed to assign not just your patent when you have it, but also your right to file a patent before you get it, your invention, insofar as it gives you a right to claim protection. And section 49 says if someone's invented something and they die, even if they don't have a patent yet, don't have a, an application for a patent yet, they can transfer the right to file said application to their, high, the, to their heirs or other people, and that's allowed. Section 50 of the Patent Act says you can assign your patent as well. It said, like all rights under intellectual property law generally, you can sell it, right? You can bargain it away. There is no specific you know, provision to the effect that you can only exercise it yourself, and so you can sell it. And that's what Section 50 says. Then there's um, something um, interesting about, um, about employment relationships, right? So so we'll erase the, the Monsanto case here. Um, Right, so as I said, right, sections 49 and 50 are about assignments. So assignment both of your patent once you have it and your right to get a patent before you get your patent, right? Then we have um, an exception about employment, which is interesting. So as we said, Essentially, um, when you have an employment relationship, generally your employer is going to benefit from that. So the best illustration of that was copyright. Copyright can be over an artistic work, as we said, but it can also be under, on, on very mundane things. If you write a web page, it might not be very good. It might not be something that anyone would pay you know, more than $15 to get, right? But it's still protected. It's your work, right? It's something you've written. It's original, meets the other criteria. It's original, fixated, and so forth. Of course, if your employer pays you, right, to write the web page, your employer is going to own the web page, even if there's not a contract that says that. And it makes sense. Because if you write a book, right, you can sell your book. Well, if you write a web page and you get paid for it, that's the same kind of compensation as selling your book, as selling the right to your book. So when you work for an employer, right, what they give you is money. And money is compensation for what? For doing your job. And what's doing your job? Well, it's coming up with web pages. It's coming up with copyrighted content. And as a result, your employer is going to own the copyrighted content. That's what they're paying you for. It makes sense, right? Um, of course, there's no need in that situation, as a result of what I've just said, for a specific provision in the contract that says, my employer will own everything I write. It's a presumption that arises out of the relationship. Often there'll be a provision, but it's not going to be necessary because it's clear from the relationship that the employer owns the content. So is that true for patent, right? The answer is maybe. And so it's very much narrower. Right? For copyright, basically, there's a presumption that your employer owns it when they pay you and what you do is in the context of your job. If you write a book while you're at work, it's not the context of your job. If you write web pages, which is what you're getting paid for, that's in the context of your job. It's not going to be true under patent law. And why is that? Right? So we might speculate on that. One of the reasons I could give you, right? again, that's just me speculating. It's not the Supreme Court said might be because a patent is not the same nature. A patent is not you writing web pages. A patent is you coming up with an invention. And the standard is higher, right? Everyone in their life is going to create copyrighted content. In fact, 
most people are going to create copyrighted content every day in their work or at home. It's not the case for patents. There's very few people in the course of their life who are going to get a patent because there's very strong you know, um, requirements. It has to be something that is new, novel, non-obvious, and useful. Right? So it has to be something that blows people away and not just anyone that positas. So the experts in the field have to think that what you're invented is new, right? You have to overwhelm the experts. They have to say, wow, we never thought of that. We never would have thought of that. It's clearly you know, non-obvious, novel, and useful. And right, you have to file your application the right way. Even if you've invented something, your application has to be framed very carefully for you to get your patent. So a patent is really a once in a lifetime or never in a lifetime event in, in a way that's dissimilar to copyright. So we might speculate that that's the reason why there isn't a systematic exception um, that says when you're at work, you don't own your stuff, your employer does. Of course, that's a presumption. In the same way that we send there's a presumption of use with possession. A presumption is, right, we assume that that's the case without you proving it. But that's rebutted. If someone proves otherwise, well then the presumption's rebutted. Then you'll have to, you know, fight over them over who's right and, you know, adduce your own evidence and then the, the judge is going to decide. So it's a presumption that's rebutted. When is it rebutted? Well, generally when it's clear that it's in the scope of your employment, right? If someone pays you $200,000 a year to invent pills, well, if you invent a pill, then it's clear that it's covered in your employment. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime event where you work for some company and then come up with something that's going to make you millions of dollars. Instead, you're getting paid specifically to come up with drugs, and therefore when you do come up with drugs, right, there's going to be you know, a strong indication that that drug is owned by your employer because they paid you for the very purpose of inventing something, of coming up with patentable, you know, inventions, right? And that's why they pay you so much money, and that's within your job description. And again, that makes it very similar to copyright. So in copyright, there's a, a presumption that always that that um, your employer owns your stuff, but the reasons for it are the same, right? Why is there a presumption? Because it's in the course of your work and you get paid for it. So in the same way, if it's in the course of your work to invent pills and you get paid for that, perhaps your employer is going to rebut the presumption that the patent is yours, not theirs. But there's a contrary presumption there. In patents, we don't assume that your employer owns your stuff. In copyright, we do. Then there's this very bizarre exception that you have of the crown. And so for some very bizarre reason, that specific um, exception is not going to apply with the government. So if you work for the government, then you're very unlucky. And there is no presumption that you own your stuff. In fact, there's a contrary presumption that the government does own whatever patents you come up with. Again, these things are just presumptions. They're not absolute rules. If you show otherwise, you might, you know, fall beyond the presumption. Then, right, we have a number of issues that arise after you get your patent. And they arise specifically because of the caveats that we looked at. So I said earlier that you don't systematically have an inspection. And I said that that probably doesn't matter all that much. So I said when you file your patent, right, there is no rule that says the government has to look at it. In fact, sometimes the government will, generally if it's a big important um, invention, right? But sometimes the government won't, generally when it's not a big important invention. And so you might get your patent without an expert from the government having looked at it and, and confirmed that it does seem like you meet the conditions. As I said though, right, there's a, a, another provision that comes right after that that says it's open to the public for exception. And I said the public is misleading. The public might mean not just some random person in their house, it generally means your competitor who have the resources and the incentive to hire some really smart people to look at whether your application is right. So even if the government doesn't approve it before you get your patent, right, so you might get it in the end without the government looking at it, right, it's open in the meantime to the public for inspection. So before you get it, right, the government publishes it and says, 
hey everyone look let's see if someone has a problem with what Phil is trying to claim as an invention if someone wants to come in and say Phil does not in fact meet the conditions now of course right the very fact that the government doesn't always look at it and the public might not look at it right if you're a big drug manufacturer your competitors will if you just made a snowmobile maybe the government's not going to care right because they have limited resources they won't spend it on some guy who invented something that might not make much money and you don't really have competitors who have a business interest to look into it so you might get a patent and it turns out you didn't meet the conditions right so we have to have a mechanism for someone to later come in and say well this is not legit and in fact we have two sections for it right so first right we have a re-examination mechanism and that's after you get your patent as I said right so after you get your patent someone can come in under section 48 of the act and say whoa this is not legit and in fact the re-examination is an administrative mechanism so they don't have to pay some really expensive lawyers to go to court and then pay some even more expensive experts to prove whatever they're saying they can just go to you know the minister for a very nominal fee certainly much cheaper than going to court and say I want you to re-examine this I want you to do either the examination that you did wrong right that you concluded was patentable but I think you were wrong or that you didn't do because as we said it's not mandatory so you can go to the government and say re-examine this and as a result the government can you know look at it again and of course if it turns out that that is um, that that is not uh, legit the government can um, cancel it and it's it's essentially the same mechanism before and after right so basically when someone opposes your thing when it's open to public inspection that can fall under that provision as well but we won't look at, to, at that in great detail and there's section 50. section 50 is um, a bit different but it exists for the same reasons and that's basically you going to the federal court to do the same thing and so you go into the federal court and saying the same thing saying it's not legit you didn't meet the conditions when you got your patent and you can do that and that's true of both the attorney general or what they call any interested person so anyone right the government or anyone else can go to the federal court and as we'll see in the next capsule that's exclusive jurisdiction so in some cases involving a patent right generally involving damages not whether your patent is valid you can go to other places like the superior court as we said you know I think in the first week or so the superior courts are these courts under the constitution of general jurisdiction basically right if you don't know where to go you have to have somewhere the constitution says you can go and that is the superior court by default whatever your problem is unless someone or something says otherwise some other law right says you have to go there or you have to go to a non you know tribunal thing like an administrative board right unless there's that by default the place you do go is the superior court well one of these exceptions is the federal court the government created the federal court and says this is a court that is going to do the things that we say so again it's not general jurisdiction and so by default the only things you can go to the federal court for is the things the government said you can go to the federal court for in the federal court act as we'll see federal court has jurisdiction over some things having to do with intellectual property so if your patent is infringed you can go to the federal court but it's not exclusive you can also go to the superior courts and say this guy infringed my patent I want money of course the reason you might go to the federal court is that it's a federal court if you go to the court in Quebec and you say someone's infringed my thing I want a declaration to that effect it might not be valid elsewhere in Canada so one of the advantages of going to the federal court is that either your injunction or your judgment is valid across Canada and so tomorrow morning you don't just go in Quebec and, and take their stuff right you can go to Alberta and take their stuff which you couldn't necessarily do with a judgment from the Quebec Superior Court so there's advantages to it but it's not mandatory for you to go to the federal court because it's not the only place you can go generally speaking and here we're making things much simpler than they are but generally speaking for things having to do with validity 
you will go to the federal courts. The federal court is deemed to be specialized in IP, and generally what that means is specialized in whether the patent is valid. And that's the complex stuff, right? The complex stuff isn't how much money you made from infringing my patent, it's whether you met the conditions which are complex, whether it was new, useful, non-obvious, disclosed properly, the claims were properly done, you know, it gets, you know, it gives us a headache, right? Everything we looked at over the past two and a half weeks, basically, right? That's a lot of stuff, a lot of complex stuff involving experts, um, and that's what the federal court's for, and that's what the federal government seems to think the federal court is better suited to do than the superior court, as a court that's specialized in that, among other things, and therefore, generally, the place you'll go and you want to say the patent is invalid is the federal court. Section 60 says the federal court has exclusive jurisdiction to void the patent, basically. So the place you go, again, after the patent to say this is not legit, I want it canceled. The guy got a patent, should never have gotten it, never met the conditions, this should be canceled. Well, who can cancel it? Only the federal court by virtue of section 60 of the Patent Act. Then we have um, also in section 48, right, disclaimer, and that's important. So as we said, generally, the, the consequence for having done it wrong, so for having said something in your patent application, sorry, it turns out to be false, is voiding the patent. So if you said, my snowmobile does A, B, and C, and C turns out to be a lie, right? We don't just cancel C, we don't just cancel your protection for the use of find in C, we cancel your protection for everything, A, B, and C. We don't get the patent at all. As I said earlier, generally that's bounded by intent. What we want to punish is not people getting things wrong, it's people lying, getting things wrong on purpose. Generally, you know, they get a patent that they shouldn't get, make money that they shouldn't make, and prevent their competitors in a way that's advantageous to them, right? That, almost always, is going to avoid the patent. There's a mechanism under Section 48 that's called a disclaimer, and that's you saying, I got it wrong. That's you saying, well, we thought C was right, but then we did more studies, right? If you didn't do them in the first place, you lied. If you did the studies, and they showed you were right, but then subsequently turns out you were wrong, then you can get, you can go through disclaimer and say, I'm disclaiming C. Essentially, you're saying, I am renouncing my protection for C. I want to keep A and B because I was wrong. And that is not mandatory, first of all. So you don't have a right for the government to only cancel C in that case. But second, as we said, it is only going to apply generally when you did not lie. When you got it wrong, but did your best to get it right, didn't know you got it wrong, and subsequently found out that was the case. 